Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the third annual Gavelli Funds Columbia Business School Healthcare Symposium. My name is Jin He. I'm a portfolio manager and biotech analyst at Gavelli Funds. This is the third year that we are collaborating with Columbia. In 2019, we had 200 attendees in person at the Paley Center in New York City. In 2020, we had 600 attendees on Zoom when we had Pfizer, Moderna, and Regeneron on our COVID panel before their vaccine or therapeutic data and approval. We're incredibly proud of our conference and strongly believe that this year will be even better. Today, we will address the topics in three panels, including the future of Alzheimer's care and treatment, new technologies in biopharma, and data mining and artificial intelligence in patient care. The format will be fireside chat, moderated by the Gabelli Fund's healthcare team, including myself, Jeff Jonas, our healthcare portfolio manager, and Kevin Kedra, our healthcare analyst. The strong lineup of speakers consists of leaders from the entire healthcare ecosystem, including providers, payers, pharmaceutical companies, and academia. We look forward to the insights from executives from New York Presbyterian, Columbia University Medical Center, Moffitt Cancer Center, Eli Lilly, Regeneron, Amgen, Johnson & Johnson, Blue Cross Blue Shield Association, among others. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Carrie Chen. Carrie is a professor in the Division of Decision, Risk, and Operations, and the faculty director of the Healthcare and Pharmaceutical Management Program at Columbia Business School. Her research is in the area of healthcare operations management. She has worked with clinicians and administrators in numerous hospital systems. She received her bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from MIT, master's and PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford University. Harry? Thank you, Jing, for that, that kind introduction. And, and thank you everyone for logging in um, and for those of it, you who are joining us in person. I hope that the next year we'll be able to gather together in person, um, perhaps at Columbia Business School's new Manhattanville campus. Um, it's, it's really wonderful to have the opportunity to come together and um, speak today about some of the most exciting trends in the healthcare space. If the last two years have demonstrated anything, it's how much the healthcare sector touches and impacts every single one of us in critical ways. We have three exciting panels today uh, that Jing, Jing mentioned, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from our highly accomplished panelists that span perspectives and roles across the healthcare spectrum. It will certainly make for a very interesting conversation. Um, before I kick off the first panel, I want to take a moment to, to thank and give a very hearty thank you to Mario Gabelli and his team at Gabelli Funds, especially Jing He, without whom this symposium would not be possible. Um, we all know Mario as a visionary uh, uh, investor that is able to cover great breadth, including the behemoth that is the healthcare sector. We are very grateful for his support for Columbia's Business School and the Healthcare and Pharmaceutical Management Program. Uh, our program aims to provide education and personal and professional uh, development opportunities for our students, um, to create long lasting relationships and engagement with our alumni, and to connect closely with the broader business community. Um, this event is an excellent embodiment of that mission. And so I want to thank the HPM team, Bianca Bellino, and uh, CBS alum and executive and resident Peter Tolman um, for the hard work that we've put together in making this happen. Um, and with that, I would like to get the official program started. Um, and I want to do that by introducing today's panelists for our first panel, the future of Alzheimer's care and treatment. Um, I'm going to provide a brief introduction of our panelists. More details can be found in the bio book that Cecilia has dropped into the chat. So there's a link there if you um, are interested in finding out more details there. Um, you'll notice that we have a Q&A box. So please feel free to use that um, and put your questions in the box there. 
So um, without further ado, um, I'm going to start by introducing our panelists. Our first panelist, uh, Phyllis Farrell Barkman, is the Global Head of External Engagement for Alzheimer's Disease and Neurodegeneration at Eli Lilly and Company, where she has worked for 25 years and previously served um, as the leader of the Global Alzheimer's Develop Disease Development Team. She's on a numerous number of boards and reviews committees related to Alzheimer's, including the World Dementia Council. Um, so it's great to, to welcome uh, her today to speak with us. Um, our second panelist is Dr. Richard Mayu, who is the chair of the Department of Neurology at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons and the neurologist in chief at New York Presbyterian Columbia University Medical System, uh, Center. Dr. Mayu is also director of the Gertrude H. Sergeyevitsky uh, Center, a center devoted to the epidemiologic investigation of neurological diseases, and co-director of the Taub Institute of, for Research on Alzheimer's Disease and the Aging Brain at Columbia University Medical Center. So welcome, um, uh, Richard. Our third panelist, um, Dr. Adam Myers is a senior vice president and chief clinical transformation officer uh, for the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. Um, in his role, he collaborates with the chief medical officers across 35 Blue Cross Blue Shield companies across the nation and leads the Office of Clinical Affairs um, and, the, uh, and the BCBS uh, Institute. Prior to joining the association in September, 2021, so he, he just joined a couple of months ago, um, Dr. Myers served as the Cleveland Clinic's Chief of Population Health and Director of the Cleveland Clinic Community Care Program. So welcome. Um, and then uh, we have uh, our other panelist who I think is uh, trying to, to log on. He might be calling me Bianca. Um, he is a professor in the Department of Neuroscience at Columbia University and a principal investigator at the Zuckerman Mind Brain Behavior Institute. Um, so we are hoping that he will be able to um, log on as we resolve those technical issues. Um, and then last but not least, ah, Frank, you're here, wonderful. Um, <laughs> throughout his career, um, Dr. Palu has focused on the identification of the molecular mechanisms underlying um, neuronal development in the mammalian brain. His research has been recognized by numerous awards for their scientific contributions. And last but not least, uh, I am happy to introduce the moderator of our panel. Um, Kevin Kedra is a senior analyst at Gabelli Funds uh, who focuses on pharmaceuticals, biotech, and animal health. He has served as a member of the healthcare team since joining the firm in 2005. So I'm really excited to um, have this um, panel get started. With that, um, we asked a poll of all of you in the audience um, and the results are in and it's, it's clear that Alzheimer has really impacted um, so many of you in, in, in various ways. 77% um, of people in the audience know someone who has suffered from Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to hand the baton to Kevin um, and really looking forward to a interesting discussion. Thank you everyone for being here. Great. Uh, thank you, Carrie. And thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, I think as, as that poll shows, uh, we all recognize that Alzheimer's is a terrible neurodegenerative disease. It afflicts an estimated 6 million Americans and is the sixth leading cause of disease-related death in the U.S. Over the past 20 years, medical science has given us countless breakthroughs against cancer, diabetes, heart disease, just about every other leading cause of death, yet we've seen virtually nothing for Alzheimer's. So I'd like to lead off our discussion by exploring just why Alzheimer's has been such a difficult disease to address, and I'd like to begin with you, Phyllis. So why has the pharmaceutical industry struggled so much to find an effective drug for Alzheimer's? Has this been a function of the drugs themselves, the underlying targets and mechanisms, or is it something more subtle like trial design? Hi, Kevin, and to the whole group. Um, th 
Thanks for having me. Um, so having been in pharma 25 years, most of that in neuroscience, but the last 10 in Alzheimer's disease, clearly Alzheimer's disease has been um, a truly formidable enemy. You know, I think primarily the brain is the next frontier. And I know Dr. Mayu knows that better than I do. So he'll probably speak to that a little bit. But what I can tell you from a drug developer's perspective, one of the biggest challenges is that we've been evaluating how to study the drugs at the same time we're studying the drugs. And this is kind of the big no-no, right, in drug development. You should have a very clear drug design, inclusion exclusion criteria, target population. And so then you have a phase three protocol that you're just running drugs through to see if they're actually doing what they're supposed to do. But I think because the um, evolution of our understanding of this disease and the pathology has been moving at the same time as we were studying the disease, and the only endpoints that we used to be able to track were cognition, which were, um, and function, which were long, um, laborious studies, we really were actually studying the study design at the same time as we were studying the drugs. Uh, the beauty of where we are right now, which is why I think so many people are very, very hopeful um, and excited about where the science is, is uh, we've had a huge amount of progress in understanding the underlying disease. You know, it was only 10 years ago that we were actually able to see the amyloid pathology in the brain that before we had to wait for autopsy to see. And so with the advent of some of these new biomarkers, imaging agents, now we're moving into new types of biomarkers, we know that this pathology starts 10 to 20 years before symptoms. So those first uh, long phase three studies that we were running, where we didn't actually see that pathology as part of the inclusion criteria of the study, we were potentially studying people who didn't have this disease. Um, and maybe even studying them much too late in the disease. So I think what's really exciting for us right now is that we finally, with a couple of recent studies, one in particular, we actually have found a really nice study design that includes the, uh, the evolution of our understanding of the pathology. So now we can really test the drugs. Um, we're still going to evolve, obviously, in our knowledge of the disease, but just the progress in the last 10 years is huge. You know, the point of the, the evolution of our knowledge, uh, talked about it from the drug side, but from our understanding of brain biology, uh, Richard, where do you think we are in understanding the brain biology, what we need to understand to address Alzheimer's, and where are there still gaps in our knowledge? Well, um, I, I, I tend to disagree with your opening statement about not much progress in the last 20 years, actually, there's been a lot of progress in, in understanding how we develop this disease. Uh, I think there's uh, the breakthroughs came in the, in the late 80s when we discovered that mutations in, a, in a, the amyloid producing uh, enzymes could lead to an early onset form of the disease that was inherited in a dominant fashion through families. And that gave us a clue that maybe late onset disease, which is much more common, uh, the 6 million that you were talking about, may also be genetically driven. And genes often lead to particular, ha have the particular advantage of they're there early, they interact with the environment, they, and they provide clues to the underlying molecular uh, mechanisms related to the disease. And I think if you were to ask a panel uh, five or six years ago, which, which are, what happens in the brain, everybody would say, well, neurons or nerve cells drop out of the brain, there's atrophy, et cetera. And we've evolved because of genetics to say, well, there's a big immune component that we never really thought about. And that's very important. And the third leg of this stool is that it's probably not one disease. Uh, about 70, 80% of patients with Alzheimer's disease also have small vessel disease, blood vessel disease in their brains, not arteriosclerotic, not typical stroke related stuff, but they have microvascular disease and that pathology has never been accounted for. And then another group, about 30%, have a different type of inclusion that's a sign of neurodegeneration. It's in something called a Lewy body named after a 
a scientist named Louis many years ago, about a third of patients do. And this is another protein called alpha-synuclein. Uh, and these, these patient groups are quite different. And uh, I don't think one drug is gonna fit all. I think we're gonna have to tailor it based on your genetic background. And hopefully as uh, Phil has already alluded to, these early biomarkers will help us get the right patient into the right category so that we can start treating them effectively. So we have learned an awful lot. Uh, and I, I would say the most exciting thing right now is the biomarkers. Uh, we've gone from brain scans, which are sort of a rough estimate of what's going on and probably too late. Uh, spinal fluid can be predictive, but you have to undergo a spinal tap to get that fluid. And plasma biomarkers have just come on board and they're probably as equally effective as spinal fluid analyses are. And that will help us immensely identify patients before they're truly symptomatic. So you, you mentioned this is you know, multiple diseases in, in one almost and a lot of pathology to the disease. Uh, yet when you, when you listen to the headlines, it seems to be beta amyloid, beta amyloid, beta amyloid. So uh, maybe for, for, for Frank um, or, or for Adam, uh, do you believe that we've been focusing too much on beta amyloid? Uh, is it as critical? Certainly it seems to be critical, but has there been just too much emphasis um, on that as a pathology to the disease? Um, I, I can take this, Adam, if you, I can start at least. Um, yeah, Kevin, I, I think you're, you're pointing to a very important factor. Um, I think it's a complex disease uh, that affects one of the most complex objects in the universe, the brain, the human brain, right? So we have uh, close to 100 billion neurons and about a trillion synapses in our brain. So we're trying to fix something that's immensely complex, right? But as Richard um, mentioned, I totally second that it's also a complex disease, not only because it affects you know, a complex uh, system, but it's a complex disease. The disease mechanisms are starting to be better understood. I think uh, because the amyloid beta uh, hypothesis was came first, I think uh, the field has focused more on that, but it's pretty clear that uh, there are multiple other uh, pathological agents, uh, including tau, of course, this, uh, that forms those tangles. There, um, um, and there seems to be now, based on, on some recent research, uh, including some of the work that, that we do and, and other people do at Columbia and, and elsewhere, that there's clearly probably a, an interaction between a bit of uh, the accumulation of this peptide outside um, neurons um, and tau uh, phosphorylation that, that occurs inside neurons. Um, but, but so those two culprits have received a lot of attention and I think um, has already translated into, you know, potential thera uh, therapeutic um, uh, agents and interventions. So far, the clinical results have been uh, moderate, I would say. Um, I think for two reasons. The first one is that there are probably many other uh, um, disease mechanisms underlying the, the, the disease progression. Uh, Richard mentioned, you know, through genetics, um, apart from, you know, uh, discovering key factors, including uh, APP that generates amyloid beta and tau mutations, which seems to have very strong effect, at least in familial forms. Um, and seems to also participate to the non-familial forms. There are many other uh, uh, genetic risks uh, that seems to contribute to uh, whether or not you will develop the disease and when you develop the disease. So um, I think this is, this is really essential. And I also think that um, uh, we need more basic research uh, to uh, accompany translational neuroscience research, right? Um, for, for the very uh, simple reason that we uncover basic principles of how the brain uh, works and, and um, how it's maintained basically um, on, on a daily basis, right? The neuroscience is, is truly an exploding field um, represented by the fact that, you know, Columbia uh, just formed this, um, the, the Zuckerman Mind Brain Behavior Institute where uh, over a thousand people now, now work on trying to understand how the brain works and how you maintain uh, normal brain function throughout uh, the life of an individual. And so there's 
clearly immense work done on the basic uh, neuroscience side um, to to try to un better understand how you, uh, you you maintain how the brain functions basically, right? And and so I think the convergence of of, of the two from the translational side understanding the disease mechanisms and from the basic side under better understanding how the brain functions um, and, and, and how it's maintained over the lifespan of, um, of, of human uh, individuals. Uh, the convergence of the two um, will provide, you know, absolutely critical and uh, insights and, and potential breakthroughs. And I think we're truly at the cusp of, of, uh, of um, you know, uh, enormous discoveries, I would say. I'm actually, um, I'm in Europe right now. I'm, I'm attending a uh, symposium on uh, that's led by Bart the Trooper, who's a, a leader in the field, and the level of excitation and excitement basically is, is, is palpable um, because there's uh, really immense new discoveries being made. Uh, you know, it's a rapidly evolving field. Sure. And Adam, uh, you know. Also, with, with beta amyloid, we've had an approval um, right. for a drug based on beta amyloid. Um, you know, from your, your point one, do you think there's been too much focus there? And two, uh, do you believe insurers are going to reimburse a drug based on a biomarker like reduction in beta amyloid without seeing um, concrete clinical evidence of efficacy? Yeah, we as a society like simple answers. Uh, you know, we like... We can visualize, you know, hammer and nail, <laughs> force and effect. We can understand single cause virus with single cause disease. We can understand those types of things. The complexity of Alzheimer's with multifactorial elements like microvascular disease, Lewy body, different types of plaques, et cetera, is difficult for people to wrap their heads around. Um, and to the degree that having beta amyloid as a proxy for the entire disease societally from an understanding standpoint has helped shed some light on the fact that this is treatable, that, that we are making progress, then I'm, to the extent that, that that simplicity has allowed the dialogue to occur, I'm fine with that from that perspective. But from, a, from those who are leaning in to advance the treatment, it's, it, it is not enough to just talk about the beta amyloid. Um, now, is the biomarker improvement enough to support reimbursement? Uh, you know, I, I think it's, it just depends. Part of it is, depends on whether or not, and I'm gonna just go larger scale than just Alzheimer's. For Alzheimer's, my personal bias is no, for a couple of reasons, but, uh, but it depends if we're talking about a disease that we knew that those biomarkers and the treatment for them was one curable or that the treatment was significantly impactful at reversing outcomes and that the expense associated with that treatment was um, affordable or palatable societally and that uh, we, we knew that, uh, that uh, this would be accessible to people then for, for a disease that a biomarker was met those criteria, yeah, that potentially could be. But ultimately at the end of the day, it's about clinical outcomes is how we should measure, in my belief, uh, the efficacy of a treatment. I understand that that's the, the problem with that is that they're long-term and it's difficult to map them. Certainly, we have a balance between biomarker improvement and long-term outcomes, functional outcomes that has to be weighed, but uh, as clinical endpoints. So I think ultimately it's a combination of both, but one without the other, I think is, is not sufficient unless we have an inkling that those biomarkers and or the treatment uh, directed at those biomarkers will be pretty consistently curative and affordable. Can I make a comment? Yeah, please. absolutely. Kevin. So, uh, you know, we're spending about $300, mil $300 billion a year taking care of patients with Alzheimer's disease. And I think it's pretty clear that these biomarkers are present and abnormal before people are symptomatic. 
Right. And uh, I guess the best and closest example is no one believe, you know, uh, high cholesterol does not cause stroke. Uh, it's a risk factor for stroke. Right. And I would guess probably half the audience is on Lipitor already, okay, to prevent that. So right. if we can use the biomarkers to figure out a preventive strategy in right. people before they become symptomatic, then I think we have something to go on. And I think the biomarkers we're looking at now are just the beginning. They're going to get better. They're going to get more specific and better. Uh, and they're already, they're changing actually almost on every six months, you get a new set of biomarkers that are more effective. So I am very optimistic that we can detect who is going to get the disease very, very early. Uh, and maybe that's, a, maybe that's an avenue for early intervention. Well, and Dr. May, you, you make a good point, but I think the point is, in addition to an asymptomatic population, an early symptomatic population. Um, because you know, what we know is we know that this is a fatal progressive neurodegenerative disease. And now that we know that these symptoms are starting 10 to 20 years after the pathology, we've been treating this disease at stage four. And I think, you know, Dr. Myers makes this point, which is doctors are used to using a symptomatic drug because that's what's available today for the most part, where you get this kind of six month cognitive bump, right? So doctors are used to seeing a reversal of symptoms or something that looks like someone getting better. Well, the disease modifying therapies that we're looking at right now, the ones that can really shift the trajectory of this disease, the ones that make a public health benefit, you won't see that bump in symptoms. You're just slowing the progression of the disease. So this is a really challenging thing for doctors who are used to saying, give me a symptom. Now I'm going to give you a drug that fixes the symptom. But what we're talking about here now is needing to catch that disease very early in the progress of the disease so that you can start slowing that progression. And I would say that's more meaningful. And now that's coming from someone who's had this in my family. But you know, the earlier I start this, the, the more, more years I have left with my loved one, the more memories that that person still gets to keep at the end of their disease. But our healthcare systems are not wired this way today. You know, they're wired for someone to be very, very late in the disease before they're even you know, willing to have a conversation with their doctor and their doctor to see something very late in the disease before their doctor is willing to give them the only things they have in their pocket, which are these symptomatic treatments. So you're talking about for healthcare systems, a complete shift in catching this disease very early. So I'm totally with Dr. Mayu. I'm, I'm hopeful for, you know, a, a full on secondary prevention, but even before we get to the asymptomatic population, we can be doing a lot better for people today that are in those early phases of those symptoms. May I add something, uh, Kevin, just briefly? Absolutely. I think the identification of biomarkers that are truly predictive uh, to, the, uh, to, to the outcome, right, of whether or not people will develop uh, full AD during these 10 to 20 years of when people are pre-symptomatic, the main impact of doing this, right, and developing accurate biomarkers that have a true predictive power is that the, the main impact will be on clinical trials. The main problem in evaluating the efficacy of, of, of any form of treatment currently available, right, including the, most, uh, the ones that have been tried most on amyloid beta, right, trying to reduce amyloid beta through different means, including antibody therapies, the the main criticism of, of those, those trials, and probably the reason I think there's consensus now, one potential reason why they failed, even though they're very effective at, at clearing uh, a beta uh, and plaques, is because the, the, the patients that were uh, treated in those uh, clinical trials were um, basically already symptomatic. And so in other words, there might not be much to rescue at, at the stage where those patients were selected. And so the novelty is that for the first time, the FDA approved um, uh, a couple of clinical trials, including one that received a lot of attention very recently. You're probably all aware of that, where there might be a, a signal. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's encouraging or not, but um, the, this is one of the first clinical trials where patients were identified using a set of biomarkers early, as early as possible, before they, uh, they show full-blown full symptoms. This is, this is a major change. This is absolutely, I think, transforming for uh, amyloid beta potential therapies. 
But I, I would argue for many other th therapies, including uh, therapies targeting tau or, or other, um, other disease mechanism, right? This will be a game changer. Yeah, and Frank's spot on on that. I think the one, the one tweak I would say, Frank, is that people did have cognitive symptoms. They didn't just have the functional symptoms of dementia. And I think this is something that's really important. Alzheimer's and dementia, these words are used interchangeably, but they're not the same thing, right? Dementia is that really late stage functional decline where people are very compromised. Our goal is to make sure people never get to that stage, but you can have Alzheimer's disease with cognitive symptoms or without cognitive symptoms. And I think to Frank's point, the studies that are coming out right now, um, we're looking at people that are early in those cognitive symptoms before they get to that very late stage that we mentally think of, right? I mean, our world mentally thinks of an Alzheimer's patient that's very, very late in the disease. And, and that's something that needs to shift. The one caveat I agree, that I like to highlight yeah. is that I think in order for us to really hang our hat on the biomarkers, we need to ensure that they are absolutely predictive of eventual pathophysiology uh, that impacts the functional. Uh, if you know, uh, otherwise we're treating a, a proxy that may not be absolutely predictive. So tr the progress that's being made in regard to that is quite quite hopeful from the standpoint of moving upstream to preventing uh, you know the the ultimate evolution of the disease. May I add one last thing, and probably as an introduction to to, uh, to Richard, who knows this much better than I do, uh, the other huge advantage of developing accurate biomarkers, right, that are based, I think, on on research on the molecular mechanisms, right, underlying the disease potentially, is also to stratify the patient, right. Richard mentioned that um, Alzheimer's might act, and I agree with, uh, with Philly's distinction, we, shouldn't stop, we should stop using the word dementia and, and talk about Alzheimer's in, in particular. But even uh, Alzheimer's patients might actually, you know, the underlying cause might be different. And we might be trying to, uh, trying uh, novel treatments to treat patients that might not have the, the same underlying cause, cause. And so stratifying the patients, if we could find biomarkers that actually would distinguish different subforms of Alzheimer's uh, might, might also have a profound impact, right? Great, so this, this conversation certainly le leading towards a question I have, which is, should we be screening for Alzheimer's like we do with heart disease and cancer as part of a routine evaluation of individuals? And the tools that we have at our hands today, uh, the biomarkers, the, the other uh, diagnostic tools, uh, are they sufficient to do that at this point? So well, just to make sure, uh, can we just be real clear, though, when we talk about screening, and then I'm sure all the panelists will have potentially different opinions on this, but there's screening for cognitive symptoms, and then there's screening for pathology. Those are two different things. Yeah. And so um, actually, the annual Medicare wellness visit in the U.S. has um, a essentially a requirement that anyone over 65 that's a Medicare beneficiary has this um, wellness exam. And that as part of that wellness exam, you're supposed to use a standardized cognitive test. That's just to identify these people with cognitive symptoms. And so to the, all the points that they've made, that could be Alzheimer's, it could be Lewy body, it could be vascular dementia, it could be depression symptoms that are manifesting themselves as cognitive symptoms, which they often do in the elderly. And I think the challenges in our country right now, I mean, we're a high resource country, that happens 4% of the time. 4% of people over 65 get that baseline cognitive assessment as essentially is required as part of that annual Medicare wellness exam. And to me, that's heartbreaking because not only does that take away that person's choice to participate in a clinical trial, right? Because they may then have their symptoms, you know, go too long before they're able to be qualified. And of course, that's something that's slowing down our research, but it also means we're not putting the support around those families for something that's a progressive disease and a very predictable progression. So I think we just need to make sure that we're, we're real careful because I think sometimes we talk about screening and it gets into this idea of biomarkers and blood tests. And, and that's a different type of question than who are the people that are sitting in a doctor's office today struggling with cognitive symptoms. And we're not doing everything we can to make 
their situation better. And there are things we can do for them today. So I just try to, whenever we talk about screening, I try to make sure we separate those two things because they may be, and they should be probably different types of answers. So Kevin, the, for, the, for the biological screening, uh, in, addition, in addition to what Phyllis is saying about the clinical screening, there are a couple things that have to happen. One is that the test has to be, as uh, Adam already said, it has to be very sensitive and highly specific. Uh, and there are different labs doing different antibody approaches, and that leads to some variability across the different laboratories. Now, there is an effort through the National Institute of Aging, National Institute of Health, which most of us are a part of, that is trying to harmonize the approach such that we get the same result in different labs. And the Europeans have done that for spinal fluid analysis of biomarkers and the plasma biomarkers are just getting underway at the present time. The second thing is that uh, we have to be prepared to deal with the result. So if I have a positive biomarker, what am I gonna tell a patient? Oh, by the way, you have a biomarker for Alzheimer's disease, good luck. I can't do that. We, we need we need to sort of have, this needs to go in parallel with some sort of treatment strategy. Uh, otherwise, you know, some people wanna know, uh, other people, uh, it's very complicated to give them that kind of information without some way of uh, some sort of treatment or preventive strategy. So I think it, it's going in parallel, it's just going much slower than any of us like. <laughs> I think it reminds me a little bit of Huntington's. Uh, you know, there's a, an element of, we have a very clear biomarker for the eventuality of that disease that's highly specific, mm -hmm. highly sensitive, but people may not want to know because uh, our ability to impact the eventuality of that prognosis is really pretty, pretty glum. Uh, so it's, uh, I, I think it's in that same category and that's to a degree, not nearly as, as definitive an outcome, but, um, you know, I, I think there's an element of it that's similar to that, that I think has, uh, created, um, an unwillingness for people to talk about this as a disease and might be even from a patient perspective, do I want to know? And do I want to know before I'm actually exhibiting symptoms? Because then am I going to be viewed as a future in Am I going to be discounted? Are my opinions, my thoughts going to essentially be discounted from that point on? Uh, will I be viewed as disabled? So there's a lot of societal layers to this, secondary to our current inability to dramatically impact the outcomes. And I'm hopeful that we can get to the point to where that stigma can lift because we're effective at treating the outcomes. I agree. The people that want to know are people who have it in their family. Uh, there's no resistance there. They're asymptomatic and they want to know what's my risk. Uh, and they're not afraid to, I mean, they want to plan. Uh, right. If they know that they're in the, the fast track, they, they want to make a decision now about what to do about their life. But you're right about the regular garden variety individual. Uh, some of them go to 23andMe and they, they ask for uh, you know, they, they go in thinking they're going to just get ancestry, but then they are tempted to go ahead and look for disease. And when it comes up with, you know, an APOE4 allele or something like that, they're panicked. And I would say in my, the seven neurologists here to see these patients, I would say 10% of the people we see are people that have a positive APOE4 analysis and they don't know what to do. They're panicked. Right. I do think there's some neat things happening that started out of the Karolinska with the finger study and Mia Kivapelto and are now being replicated around the world uh, with the help of the Alzheimer's Association that are looking at some um, risk reduction lifestyle modifications. And I do think that for those folks that have this in their family, for those folks that are already health seeking and motivated, um, there are some amazing things and good data coming out that you can do to, uh, to make yourself more resilient if this disease comes for you. You'll never blueberry your way out of Alzheimer's disease. And we should never blame a patient for, um, for conducting this disease or uh, having this disease. But we do know that these, uh, there's about seven or eight behaviors 
that you can, I think it's eight, that you can do that will make a difference in how your body responds if this disease comes for you. And um, I think that's really, really a public health mindset for us because they also happen to be the same behaviors that we need to tackle for heart disease and diabetes and other metabolic disorders. So it's, it's really, you know, Alzheimer's disease is the most feared disease in the world, more than cancer, even in the US. And if that motivates people to take better care of their health and their spillover benefit into um, other NCDs, that's something that we should be taking advantage of as a population. Great, Phil, that's a great point. Um, you know, I, I think when people think about treatment for Alzheimer's, everyone wants to jump to, you know, it's a therapeutic treatment. And there are a lot of different ways that we can um, attack this disease, uh, you know, especially early uh, within the onset. So uh, maybe it'd be good to go around, around the group uh, and maybe we'll start with, start with you, Frank. Uh, where do you see the most promising opportunities over the next five years, um, you know, five to 10 years in terms of new biologic targets, technologies, or approaches to Alzheimer's that you believe are going to create the biggest beneficial difference in patients' lives? I would say, I would say there, there, there are two angles that seem to me uh, incredibly promising uh, from the understanding the basic mechanisms, the underlying mechanisms. The first one, we just talked about uh, the fact that clinically, I, I think there's consensus recognizing that the disease starts, um, you know, with either mild cognitive impairment or, or some form of cognitive impairment um, a decade at least before, um, before um, the, the disease is, you know, affecting uh, other uh, cognitive, you know, provides much more severe cognitive symptoms, including learning and memory and, um, and other symptoms. So during this phase, I think animal models um, have provided some key uh, answers, uh, which is that basically during this, this phase, um, some of the, the cognitive symptoms are due to the fact that you're not yet losing neurons, right? There's no full-blown full neurodegeneration yet, but you, you're losing synapses. Circuits in your brain, especially in the hippocampus and associated circuits, um, lose connections, those neurons get disconnected. And so there's tremendous um, efforts right now to understand what are the molecular mechanisms underlying synaptic loss during this early pre-symptomatic phase. I think this is the most exciting, um, um, one of the most exciting area of research right now. And, and, and the field is moving very fast. Uh, <laughs> it's, actually hard to keep up with, uh, with the level of, um, of, of progress on, on that side. So that, that to me is one of the most exciting area and we're actively you know, participating to this. The second avenue, there's clearly um, uh, an, another key component of the disease progression, at least at the cellular level, is the function of non-neuronal cells in the brain, including microglial cells. They're the only cell type in your brain that are um, that are uh, uh, immune, immune competent. They're, they're the immune cells of your brain. And <clears throat> there's um, emerging evidence suggesting that microglial cells, dysregulation of microglial cell function um, plays, a, plays a role in the disease progression. And, and again, at those very early stages when, um, when I think it would be most efficacious to um, to, to intervene with uh, therapeutic uh, treatments. So the function of those of microglial cells, especially in uh, synaptic loss, right? In loss of uh, synaptic connections between neurons um, is, a, is a also a, a, an incredibly active area of research right now, which is actually interestingly corroborated with some uh, genetic risk factors that people have identified um, that seems to affect genes specifically uh, expressed and uh, playing important function in microglial cells. So those to me are the two of the most uh, interesting and, and emerging area of, um, of, of research on, uh, on the disease mechanism. Great, Frank. What about you, Adam? I'm going to take a slightly different approach. Uh, agree with all of the above, and I'm sure Dr. Mayo and Phyllis will add, uh, you know, layers to that piece as well. But I think 
the reality of Alzheimer's currently challenges us as a society to think more about end of life in a more, in a different way, uh, to think about hospice, to think about palliative care, to think about caregiver support, um, not just for Alzheimer's, but for, you know, the end of life for all of us. Uh, you know, that's, that's the way out of this thing called life that we're in. All of us are going to end up on that path at some point or another. And societally, we do not do well at managing that transition. So I, I am hopeful that the conversation around Alzheimer's can obviously move upstream toward prevention, can move you know, to the, to the eventual identifiable, sensitive, and specific biomarkers that we can learn to intervene on and prevent the, uh, the disease. But until then, and then even after then, not everyone is going to be fortunate enough to avail themselves of those treatments. Until then, I think we have a, an opportunity to do a far better job of managing end of life uh, with people and emphasizing palliative care. Yeah, and it's definitely something I think gets overlooked a lot in these conversations. Phyllis, what about for you? Well, so what am I excited about? Actually, I'm gonna uh, build on a question that's in the chat from uh, Lori about precision medicine. You know, I think what I'm really excited about um, in this field is we've gone from, and as Adam said, this you know dementia, late life kind of old, uh, very very late stage patient to now knowing uh, that there's a pathological component to this. And the more we understand the pathology, the more we start to be able to differentiate what these different causes of dementia are, you know, whether it's Alzheimer's, vascular, et cetera. And so Lori asked the question about precision medicine. To me, that's what we're doing. We're moving from a clinical presentation of a disease to something that we can pathologically understand what the underpinnings are and be able to stage. So you're starting to look at this kind of like you would almost oncology, right? We all would always want to treat oncology at stage one versus stage four. And in cancer, think about this. We know about these different types of tumors. We know now what the different tumor types, even within say a lung cancer or a breast cancer, we can differentiate within. And so I'm excited because we're really moving from what was kind of seen as a late, you know, how many times have you heard old timers? or just normal aging, or this is just something that happens, which is just an ageism and a stigma causing way of thinking about this disease to something that's a pathological disease that we can now stage and really treat with precision medicine. And, and I think that's a huge benefit to what Dr. Myers was saying about how we think about ourselves as we age and how we think about others as we age. Because when you tell somebody that there's pathology in their brain, um, that's causing these symptoms, they're no longer weak. They're no longer crazy. This really reduces the stigma of mental illness. And there's so much stigma around this disease. People aren't even talking about it. They're hiding things from their doctors and their families when we can do things for them. So to me, that's what I'm really excited about is this, it's now clinical and pathology, and we need to make sure we get both of those things right. Great, Phyllis. And Richard, for you. Well, slightly different. I mean, uh, we started off talking about amyloid and tau deposits in the brain, and then I mentioned genetics. So amyloid and tau are sort of the, 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 last, the last part of your life, and the genes are things that you're born with. They're the genetic variation. And what's happening now, uh, which I'm very happy about and very happy to be a part of it, is that we're taking each gene and figuring out what it does normally and what it does when it's mutated or changed in some way, either its expression has changed or the type of protein it produces has changed and how that fits along this pathway to eventual amyloid and tau accumulation. Because I think that's where the targets are gonna be most useful. And it may be different depending on what your genetic background is. I'm almost certain it will be, but that gives me a lot of optimism that we're on the you know, this is going to happen and it's hopefully going to happen in my lifetime. Uh, it better happen in my lifetime. <laughs> Great. So I think with that, we, we can move to, 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 we've got a few minutes for the Q&A. Some of the questions have been submitted. Maybe I'll, I'll 
I'll start with the first one here. Um, it'll be a jump ball for, for anyone on the panel. What is your view on inflammation as an early warning signal for mental health disease? Well, I'll start off. I mean, uh, there are multiple diseases in which inf inflammatory changes in the brain occur and they're not all Alzheimer's disease. The inflammatory component of Alzheimer's disease is probably due to some microvascular and neurological changes that are happening in the brain as a result of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, it's, it's not clear, at least it's not clear yet that uh, inflammation leads to Alzheimer's disease or it leads to this other process. But there are a lot of things. There are diseases though that present late in life that look like Alzheimer's disease that are due to inflammatory conditions, uh, remote effects of uh, carcinomas, inflammatory disorders, et cetera. Uh, so uh, there are two different things. I hope that answers the question. Well, and I think Richard, you also uh, bring up back to something that Kevin asked us earlier, which is, are we focusing too much on amyloid? You know, I think, you know, what happens in drug development, right, is you find a target and a target that's druggable and that moves through the process first. It used to be we had this big fight going on in the field between amyloid and tau, right? It was the Baptists, the beta amyloid and the Taoists. And I think finally as a field, we've started to realize it's not either or, it's part of this amyloid cascade. So amyloid happens very early, then tau, and then as Richard Pohl mentioned, inflammation follows. And, and there's gonna be more, right? The more we learn about this, more we're gonna find that this is part of a disease cascade process. So, you know, I, I would, I would caution us to worry about, are we focusing too much on amyloid? Because what you're probably just seeing, in fact, what you are seeing is that's the first target we identified early in the disease process. And now you're going to see the tau products coming through. And then I think you see a lot of the uh, both basic researchers as well as industry researchers, researchers working on, on inflammation and then on microglia and you know all the other disease pathologies. But I liked what you said, Richard, that it's important to think about inflammation as a final common pathway for many uh, neurological diseases and whether inflammation is a precursor and trigger for the disease. It's an important distinction between those two because you know how you approach them and whether that impacts the outcome or treatment is, is, a, is very different. I would tend to agree with both what Adam and Richard just said about inflammation as a, as a key uh, risk factor, whether it's you know, uh, causal or, or just um, participates to the disease pro uh, progression. In fact, what I mentioned about uh, microglial cells, right, the, uh, the only immune cell type in your brain uh, seems to be uh, the key target of, of inflammation. Uh, and in fact, um, not only a target of inflammation that's peripheral, but, but uh, centrally in the brain, uh, participate to the to the increased inflammation. So again, that's a that's a relatively new area of research. Huh? We we we've, we've started uh, um, identifying microglial cells as a key culprit, at least a cellular cul culprit in the disease progression, uh, relatively uh, 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 relatively recently. I would say in the past uh, four or five years. Right. So, so um, what I'm trying to say here is that uh, there is still you know big discoveries being made at very fundamental level of, of how the brain functions in the first place and, and, and what is uh, going wrong in, in the brain of uh, Alzheimer's patients early in the disease. This is, uh, we're, we're still navigating, you know, uh, in the unknown here. There's, there's still a lot to learn. And, and the good news is that, you know, the pace of discoveries is, in my opinion, absolutely remarkable. Uh, over the past 10 years, I think largely because of the, you know, the effort uh, put um, uh, on, you know, promoting basic neuroscience research, I would say, uh, we understand so much better uh, how the brain functions and, and the techniques that are, uh, that are developed to understand how the brain functions in the, you know, normally uh, has had a, a tremendous impact on understanding the disease mechanism. I can't reinforce that enough. Yeah. I think we've got time for one, one more question. Um, I think this is a pretty good one coming in. Uh, what do we know about, about differences in sex and gender in terms of, of Alzheimer's and, and maybe beyond that, um, demographic factors like socioeconomic factors of race? Um, 
how do we know, what do we know about their impact on Alzheimer's and does it tell us anything that could help us in, in, in conducting earlier, uh, early preventative treatment? There are sex differences even in, in genetic risks. So, and we don't fully understand whether there's a resilience given one's uh, sex or not. Uh, and we also know that there are uh, racial and ethnic differences in the risk of Alzheimer's disease and how much of that is due to you know, social factors that are unmeasured typically in these epidemiological studies. Uh, but that, those studies are underway. And I would say over the next couple of years, we should, we should understand those differences much better than we do now. And yeah, building our exclamation point on uh, Richard's comments, African-Americans are two times more likely to be impacted by this disease and the Latinx population is one and a half times more likely. Uh, we don't know exactly yet whether that is uh, you know, something that's underpinning biologically around race or if that ha has to do with social determinants of health and the fact that these individuals have some of the same challenges as it relates to other metabolic diseases. As it relates to women, um, Richard is spot on. There is a difference um, that if you can't just account for age, with age being the greatest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, women live longer, so you might think that's it, but that doesn't explain all of it. But the other thing I would be remiss if I didn't mention to this group is women are also disproportionately impacted as unpaid caregivers and as paid caregivers. So most of your healthcare workers, and we know from COVID that those wages are not sufficient for that, for that population. And even in the unpaid care, you mentioned earlier, you know, $300 million that we're spending, uh, that's, that's direct spend. That doesn't actually capture what right. the out-of-pocket family impact. The, um, the, the standard of care for Alzheimer's disease right now is an unpaid family caregiver. And that is four right. to one times more likely to be a woman than a man. And women are dropping out of the workforce to care for their loved ones. And um, this, we're gonna, we're gonna completely roll back. I mean, I'm talking to a business school population. All the gender progress we have made in diversity in the workforce is gonna get rolled back if we don't slow down this disease and provide, as Adam mentioned, some uh, late life and caregiver support because women are honored to take care of our loved ones but stepping out of the workforce is not the solution to do it. So it's, it's both the, uh, the patient and the, and the caregiver that I get real passionate about. Great, Adam, Frank, anything you guys want to add? No, I think they've covered it. Well, I think we're ju just up, uh, just pressing up against uh, the end of time. So I wanna take this time again, uh, Frank, Adam, Richard, Phyllis, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your insights. Um, it's been a pleasure moderating this panel. It's been incredibly informative for me. I hope so. likewise it has been for, for the audience. And uh, I believe with that, I think we, we're we going to be moving on to uh, a break ahead, a short break ahead of the uh, next panel. So thank, thank you, you, Kevin, everyone. and to the thank whole you. team. Yeah, Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all of you. What a wonderful discussion. So we are going to take a 10 minute break and we will start again promptly at 1010 um, and look forward to seeing all of you back in a, a little bit. Welcome back everybody. Uh, it was really wonderful to have such a, an engaging conversation in the, the last panel and, and talking about ways that uh, Alzheimer's care and treatment will be conducted in, in the future. Um, and the potential of scientific advancements is certainly on theme with our second panel um, on new technologies and biopharma. So I'm thrilled to introduce our, our set of panelists today. Uh, so first, um, Dr. Joseph Elsel is a senior medical director in oncology medical affairs at Regeneron Pharmaceuticals, where he leads activities for both the non-melanoma skin cancer and cervical cancer indications. He has also spent time with the Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association, where he led the development of biologics and biosimilars policy and advocacy positions on US and international regulatory pathways, patents, data exclusivity, access, and other um, user fee agreements. Our second panelist is Eve Kreschmer. 
um, who is the head of corporate strategy and development at Generate Biomedicines, a therapeutics company at the intersection of ML and biotech, where she is a member of the management team with responsibility to lead strategy and execute high impact cross-functional initiatives across the company. She previously led strategy and transformation at Bluebird Bio. Our third panelist is Dr. James Meal, the Associate Center Director for Translational Science and Interim Associate Center Director of Basic Science, and the Michael McGilly Cuddy Endowed Chair for Melanoma Research and Treatment at Moffitt Cancer Center. Dr. Meal serves on advisory boards of numerous biotechnology and pharmaceutical companies and is also a special government employee to the FDA and NCI. Our fourth panelist is Dr. Ryan Potts, um, who is the executive director and head of the induced proximity platform at Amgen that focuses on drug discovery for disease targets that are currently viewed as undruggable. Prior to his time at Amgen, Dr. Potts was an associate professor in the Department of Cell and Molecular Biology at St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. And then our fifth panelist is Dr. Bing Wang, who is the CEO of Refuge, a company he co-founded following nearly a decade of life science investment banking experience. He most recently served as Director of Healthcare Investment Banking at Barclays Capital, where he served as Strategic Financial Advisor and helped raise capital for companies in the healthcare industry. Dr. Wan, a cancer survivor who is passionate about bringing forth smarter medicines that will transform cancer care. And details of all of our panelists' background are again included in the bio book um, that is made available to all of you. And last but not least, I'm happy to return the platform to my co-host, um, Jing He, who is a portfolio manager and research analyst covering the biotech industry. She joined Gabelli Funds after receiving her MBA from Columbia Business School. Um, and prior to that, she worked at Regeneron as a scientist in drug research and, de and development. So just as a reminder, please feel free to use the Q&A box to um, ask your questions to the panelists. We'll have 10 minutes at the end for that. Um, and then finally, um, to just kind of kick uh, things off in this theme of technology in, in this space, we had a panel question um, a, for all of you. Um, and the question is, are you surprised by how quickly COVID vaccines were developed and approved? Um, and there's a a resounding majority here that 76% um, are, are saying yes, um, although um, I'm curious about those 24% of you who are, who are not surprised by things. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it off to our, our wonderful panel, and I'm looking forward to hearing um, this discussion today. Thank you for being here. Okay, great. Thanks, Carrie. So I'd like to start from the most frequently asked question, also the question you saw on the poll. Um, from our audience registration, uh, which is COVID, we're still in the pandemic. Um, so for the panelists, I guess, how do you think COVID has changed the drug development timelines and regulatory pro process? Uh, given that COVID vaccines were developed just in one year, do you think these changes will stay? Um, I would just start with Joe, since Regeneron played an important role in this. And uh, then any panelists, feel free to jump in. Thank you. Um, anyone else want to jump in? Okay, um, I guess now let's move on to cell therapy. Uh, we have seen it on the news constantly. We have seen T cell therapy, NK cell therapy, CRISPR last year that won the Nobel Prize. Um, so for the panelists, the industry has made tremendous progress in cell engine therapy in the past few years. And recently we have seen some challenges in clinical trials, manufacturing, and commercialization. So question for you, what are the major challenges for you and your organization? I'll start with Jim and then um, Eve being a right, you, you can uh, talk about your challenges that you're seeing. All right, thanks, Jing. Um, well, you know, I think uh, there are a couple of challenges. The first is we're living uh, in an environment now where many cancer patients have received checkpoint uh, checkpoint blockade therapy. 
And uh, when they fail, which they often do, um, you know, we are left with a patient population that's very challenging. And, uh, uh, and uh, that's the reality. And uh, many of these uh, cell-based therapies that have been developed uh, haven't been challenged yet to that degree, especially with solid tumors. I think with CAR-T with hematologic uh, malignancies, uh, it's very encouraging. But with solid tumors, that's the real challenge. And, and again, uh, the patient population has changed. Uh, you know, we, as you pointed out, there are a number of uh, cell-based therapies that are being developed um, uh, using macrophages, using uh, PMNs, using NK cells, uh, T cells, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, and the jury's still out. Uh, I mean, uh, it, I certainly haven't seen uh, compelling evidence of uh, at least in the CAR-T space of, of compelling clinical responses in solid tumors, um, except uh, for tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. I think there's real promise there. Uh, the other challenge, of course, is vectors. And uh, we'll get, I believe we'll get into this later. But the availability of having uh, vectors for CAR-T or TCR or for that matter, uh, genetically engineering cells to, to either make them far more potent in the tumor environment or resist uh, elements in the tumor microenvironment that shut them down. Uh, you know, there are companies out there that are developing non-viral methodologies, which, uh, it, which, is certainly, which are certainly encouraging, but we're still left, in the, certainly in the near future with, with viral vectors. Um, so manufacturing of viral vectors, getting in the queue, uh, everybody needs them, everybody wants them, it is, uh, it, I think is a challenge for all of us. And I would just layer on there, I mean, I think, as Jim was mentioning, the manufacturing process, the duration of getting cells to patients in time, the complexity of that process and the costs associated with it. You know, I think lessons learned, a lot of companies in this space have to be really thoughtful about COGS, um, both in order to manage their own businesses, but also to enable pricing that is um, not so far out of bounds and ensure access to great patient populations that are really in need. Um, you know, there's, there's innovative partnerships out there with companies that are trying to think differently about manufacturing, you know, elevate the resiliences of the world. And so I think what we'll see over time is the paradigm shifting um, because it's expensive to own your own manufacturing facilities as a small company. And so the more that we can look for innovative ways to partner uh, that will help everybody in the system. Um, and I think you're seeing a lot of that. I think the other piece is just a, an interesting dynamic on a regulatory front. Um, you know, the, the cell and gene therapies are extremely promising, but a little bit scary. And so the way of thinking about the regulatory pathway when you have a really innovative product and trying to think differently about uh, ways to get those, those assets to market without slowing them down too much while adhering to the highest standards of, of safety and efficacy, I think is important. And there's a lot of good movement with the regulatory agencies there and an interest to drive that forward. But I think that is something that's been a challenge for most companies in this space. You know, one, one of the major challenges uh, that I see is uh, potency assays. Uh, you know, obviously, the FDA re is requiring potency assays, especially, uh, as was pointed out by the others, um, we're dealing with a cell product, uh, uh, which uh, is, is quite variable between patients. And, uh, you know, the standardization is a little bit difficult. Um, each patient is very different. Um, so, and you've seen this, I, I think you've heard about it more than once, companies have a problem if they do not start their potency assay early. 
And uh, that is a crucial part of the manufacturing process and characterization is to lock down what the potency assay is going to be. Thanks, Jim. Uh, ben, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I echo a lot of points that Jim made. I think a key part is, is your patient population, um, especially for some of the hemo patients, or even potentially at some point, say for breast cancer, a lot of the patients who would get uh, the cell therapy first have gone through cycles of chemo or other immunotherapy. So not only are the fact that they're just in worse shape, but their, their T cells or NK cells, whatever you're trying to modify, is just not the same as some you know healthy 22 year old. So I think, and that factors into the potency assay point he was making as well. So I think that's absolutely critical in terms of how you think about how do you design your trials and you know your strategy in terms of, well, is this gonna start as a fourth line therapy and how are you going to get that to second line therapy, for example, which is traditionally the path for small molecule and large molecule for, for cell therapy, that, that's a very different strategy. And then from the manufacturing perspective, one of the things that people don't think about for cell therapy is, is cold chain logistics. I mean, when we have to deal with it for the first time, it's, it's it, we didn't even know it was a thing, for example, when we started, right? You know, you have a patient, for example, somewhere in California. And then you need to extract their T cell through leukophoresis, but you need to find a way to freeze it and send it to Philadelphia for manufacturing and then bring it back. You know, that is not something that traditional drug maker have to you know, deal with. You know, potentially if you were to do clinical trials in a place like Moffett or MD Anderson, you know, the manufacturing and the patient population could be in the same vicinity. But once you start to go to larger phase three trials, for example, that just becomes more difficult and not to mention what happened to, to do it commercially. That's a really good point. So I guess we mentioned manufacturing challenges over there and definitely some changes on the regulatory front. Um, I want to uh, move forward to the reimbursement and then we come back to that. I think some of you have mentioned. Um, so let's talk about the elephant spent in the room, drug pricing. We have seen 200,000 for innovative oncology drugs, 400,000 for T cell therapy, and one to two million of price tag for gene therapy. So how do we pay fair price to incentivize innovation and in the meantime, not bankrupt the healthcare system? Um, I would like to hear uh, all the panelists on this because this is such an important issue. So maybe, maybe I can start. Um, so Jing, the other issue is what the, the cost of what treatments those patients receive prior to getting a cell-based therapy. Uh, it's enormous. Uh, when you think uh, either they've had targeted drugs, uh, they've had um, you know, BRAF inhibitors in the setting of melanoma, uh, they, they blew through uh, checkpoint antibody therapy, uh, uh, and now they're left with uh, receiving cell-based therapies, which as you pointed out, in, in and of itself is expensive. But when you look at the entirety of the therapeutic uh, uh, efforts that have been made in each given patient, uh, the cost uh, you know, obviously escalates dramatically. Uh, I certainly don't have an answer. And what we're also seeing is triple combinations uh, of therapeutics, uh, the cost of that. Um, you know, my view is uh, uh, until the, uh, you know, the, the feds step in, uh, you know, it's going to be status quo as far as I can see. I think one, one key point to make there is, <clears throat> um, as you think about pricing, you could have a big pharma going to the insurance company and say, look, use our cell therapy, you know, this is, um, this is curative. So you might say five years on some, you know, a drug that could cost $100,000, $150,000 a year. So therefore, you should pay us for that five years of savings. But the insurance company can come right back and say, well, okay, well, why don't you do a trial of five years and show me that? And then we'll talk about that type of logic, right? So obviously there's some back and forth in there on the compromise, but that, that is the type of pricing you know, debate a sponsor would have for the insurance company where you know, you're not gonna fully get the value that you think you, you provide because first of all, to do that study would be you know, cost prohibitive from both a financial and time perspective. I think the second point on that is you know, right now, you'll make more money on a $100,000 small molecule cancer drug than a $500,000 cell therapy. 
the margins on the cell therapy is just not there. You know, just the, the virus, getting the lentivirus itself will, will, will kill most of your margin. So, you know, we also have to think about, what, you know, the margins for the sponsors. I couldn't, couldn't agree more, Bing. I think, you know, I, and to echo some of the other comments, right? I think uh, we have to think, what does it work to cure somebody and prevent these diseases? You look at a patient population with sickle cell disease. These are young people who are constantly at, in the emergency room um, with all sorts of challenges and access. And I think part of the challenges in pricing is we're looking at the wrong metrics, not always, but sometimes, right? We have to be thinking about assets that are one time with curative intent differently than a typical product. And we have to think that, you know, there has to be an openness of the assessment of the lifetime cost of a disease like sickle cell disease. When you're, when you're going through that negotiating process, Knowing again that the margins, as you said, are are not are not high because of the COGS challenges in manufacturing. So it's not to say that all drugs are warranted at high prices. Just that that you know curative therap therapies, I think, will um, and are forcing us to rethink the underlying methodology for assessment of of what's reasonable in in pricing. Great. Uh, Ryan, do you want to jump in? Nothing more for me. Okay, good. Um, I guess my next question, um, just to follow up on your on your point, on the commercialization side, um, as we're seeing more targeted therapy, personalized medicines. So how do you go out and find the most appropriate patients? Right, I know you have experience um, dealing with drugging the un undruggables. So how do you feel about that? And then maybe Joe, Joe, you can uh, jump in as well. Yeah, you know, I think what we need to is we need to expand networks of, uh, you know, in the oncology space. Uh, for instance, Orion is one example, but there are others uh, where you have turnkey. Uh, the, the centers within the network share the same uh, consent form. Uh, they have the same protocol. Uh, a database is built on genomics and to some extent proteomics, uh, uh, it, but all of this requires a, a, a database that um, can, can handle uh, the amount of information that is, you know, basically user friendly amongst the network sites. But the, the you know, the, the beauty of that is that at any given time, you have a substantial number of patients that are already characterized uh, genomically. Uh, you know what treatments they've already received, the tumor type, and so forth. Uh, and so, when uh, you know when the need is there to to open up a trial with a you know with a certain patient population, uh, it should be turnkey. Uh, we're not there yet. Uh, but certainly, you know, that's where I think uh, there will be great value in lowering some of the cost also. Obviously, you don't want to put a patient on the trial that's not going to respond. So. That's a really good point. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to just add to what everyone was saying, right? There is a, it's, it's interesting to think about taking a page out of the retailer's books, right? So, you know, there was this article in 2012 or something about the predictive analytics that Target uses to, to guess at basically when a woman's pregnant and actually preempted her own knowledge. And I think it's interesting to see the pharma industry and biotech sort of catching up to that but slow at a slower rate, right? So there's so much we can do harnessing the power of data, leveraging it across an ecosystem, including claims data and all sorts of information that's out there and, and leveraging, I think, AI, machine learning and other types of predictive analytics to be thoughtful and proactive about how we not only find patients, but make sure that they're on the best therapies for them at the time they need them, right? And that is, I think, something that I hope is pushed also by the, by the pandemic in some ways, because it's accelerated the rate at which we are comfortable doing those things, um, you know, running um, clinical trials, 
a, in a totally different way because you're not having people sign up for 12 pieces of paper in a hospital, right? They're doing it online. And so there's, I, I think there's a huge momentum there that we can capitalize on to really change the way we think about finding those patients. Great, thanks Eve. Um, you guys all have mentioned manufacturing, the challenges there and how you have been tackling that. Um, I guess recently the launch of some cell therapies get delayed due to the shortage of viral vector. You touch on that, that as well. Um, some biotech companies are building manufacturing even before entering the clinic. Others using third party contract manufacturing. So how can we be better prepared when we launch a, such a complicated treatment? Um, I'll start from Jim. I know you've done a ton of work in this and then I'll move on to being and Eve. Maybe you can talk about upstream, downstream. You know, it's a, it's, it's a real issue. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of frustration there. You know, as, as, a, as a cancer center, um, we developed our own uh, significant GMP facility for cell manufacturing. Um, uh, we also uh, got board approval uh, about six months ago to set up our own viral vector facility, which is in process now. Uh, because in reality, uh, the cell manufacturing is going, uh, in my view, very well. The, and again, the problem is getting access to vectors. And, and uh, until, until non-viral vector uh, shows its worth in, in, uh, in cells, uh, we're, we're going to be stuck with this for a while. But, but again, I think we're going to see more individual sites developing their own manufacturing capacity and not being held hostage uh, by um, external firms that have a, a long lead time to get into the queue. I think it, 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 there is a bifurcation of strategy right now um, in terms of how a smaller biotech deal with this, right? On the one hand, you could have companies like Lyo or Sana or Allergy that will raise hundreds of millions of dollars to have their own manufacturing capability. But on the other hand, and, and, and Eve alluded to this as well, you have the Elevate Bio and the Alliance of the World, where they're trying to create almost like a TSMC in semi semiconductors, but for, for, for cell therapy. And where smaller companies can actually outsource a significant portion of the whole development. You know, it's not just CMO, it's CDMO, Contract Development Manufacturing Organization. To, to these entities and then pay them for it. That will probably be more expensive long-term than building your own manufacturing capability, but you actually de-risk some of it because they already have best-in-class capabilities there. If you were to develop your own manufacturing capability, the big problem you have in biotech right now is just people getting poached left and right. So you could spend a lot of time developing the team that can do this, and then the next biotech that just raised $200 million would just poach your entire team and you're kind of, you know. So I think you balance the, the financial uh, commitment and, and, the, and the human resource commitment, you know, that, that really, that becomes a harder question, I think, for startups as they think about capital allocation with respect to manufacturing. I don't think, uh, I don't have an answer to that, but I think those are some of the thoughts that's going on in a lot of companies right now. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's no, there's no question that at some level sort of the bespoke in-house manufacturing is a huge asset to any company that's in the space right now. I think that, that the ex, expense of operating that and the, the connectedness of the whole ecosystem is really important because you have to do that well in advance of when it's needed. When it's needed, it has to turn on and be functional right away. And the time between those two things occurring is just a huge potential liability. And so you know, smaller companies being able to leverage partnerships there to lower that that ongoing run rate cost, um, I think is pretty critical. Um, but it's something that every company is going to have to think about differently uh, based on where they are and making sure that when they're ready to go, when they've got that approval, when those products need to get to patients, that they have the system online and running and that those things are really tightly correlated or, or coordinated, because if it's not, it um, becomes even more problematic financially. You know, being hit on another issue, and that is the workforce. I, I can tell you, we've trained a lot of cell therapists in our, in our cancer center that then left to go, to go to industry. 
uh, and that's what we're always challenged with. But we, you know, we and others are linking up with universities uh, and uh, and community colleges uh, to work on curricula for uh, for specific. Uh, training of, of students uh, in this space. And uh, I think we're going to see more of that going forward because uh, it's becoming an issue uh, with the workforce. Thanks, Jim. Uh, my next question, um, I guess broadly, what type of technology or innovation are you most excited about in the next five to 10 years? I think I'll start with Ryan and Joe here because we talk about challenges in cell therapy and Andrew and Regeneral might have been through all these a decade ago. So how do you feel about innovation in small molecules and biologics today? Great, um, Eve, Jim, and Bean, do you want to jump in on this? Sure, I'll, I'll throw in a... a as a segue maybe to your next panel, but um, kind of AI machine learning and computer power, right? I, I think that it's um, just going to usher in a new era of drug development. We have to think about and invest in truly disruptive innovation in order to move the needle in a big way. Um, and I think a lot of that comes down to um, you know, different ways of finding new targets. Certainly generate as a company, that believes that you know we will be able to generate um, therapeutics as opposed to discover them through trial and error. Um, and that if you deploy machine learning at scale, um, there's a lot of ways that we can radically change the drug development process and, and, and democratize therapeutics as a result of that. And so I think this, this wave of data and the computing power and the understanding that we have scientifically in different areas is all gonna come together um, pretty, pretty amazingly in the next um, five to 10 years. And we should uh, take advantage of that. So that's what I'm looking forward to seeing. Obviously I'm a little biased based on my current role, but um, I think that's gonna be a, a, fun, a fun area of the industry to watch. Right. Um, so now we're, uh, we have nine minutes. So I'll take one question from the audience from Injo. I think this is a really good question. Um, will there ever be a biosimilar to cell and gene therapy to improve patient access? If so, what makes a product to be considered as biosimilar? What will be the analytical characterization be conducted? I think he or she is definitely thinking about 10, 20 years ahead, but. <laughs> Would love to hear your hear your thoughts. I never, if I could start, um, I, I never thought of that question before. But if I were to think um, just on my feet, what that would look like, I think it would uh, be on beyond the, on the vector level. So if there's an approved product using a particular lentivirus, and you can show that this lentivirus is similar, uh, because the cells come from the patient, at least from a toggle therapy. Then it goes to Jim's earlier point is, what is a potency assay? So if you can have a biosimilar, well, well called vector similar, um, uh, that's based on a proof product for cell therapy, and you can show through a potency assay, as Jim highlighted earlier, of the approved product, uh, potentially then that, that would be the argument you would make on, on using biosimilar for, for cell therapy. But again, I'm literally just coming up with that right now. Jim, do you want to share your thoughts? Uh, you know, it's a, it, I, I haven't thought about it either. I mean, uh, I, I don't know how to respond to that, but, but uh, it, you, you know, it's not the same, but I mean, there are a lot of efforts in using aloe cells, you know, universal in, your, in a way uh, where the cell, the cell is kept fully characterized. Uh, and then as Bing points out, you can use a fully characterized vector in an, in an allo setting with a, potentially a universal patient cell, uh, you know, uh, that's been CRISPRed in ways that are not recognized. But um, it, yeah, I really haven't thought about it. <laughs> that's a really good point. Uh, I have another related question from the audience. When do you think you can, we can expect these technologies to be 
mainstream, I guess that's whether being off the shelf that we talk about or drug the undruggables. I know Amgen has one approved, but then we have more down the road. Or as you've mentioned, machine learning, AI, uh, when, I guess from a timeline standpoint, if you look at the crystal ball that you have, when do you think we'll, we'll, we'll be like using it more broadly? Uh, you know, I think you can look at CD19 cars as as one uh, sort of mainstream now in, in uh, certainly in B-cell lymphomas. Uh, it's gone to the outpatient setting now, and more and more centers are opening up to deliver CAR T. Uh, and, you know, it's almost in record pace when you consider the first approval, you know, Novartis and, and, and Kite. Uh, it's really, uh, it's really, uh, um, you know, it's how you define mainstream, but, but I think, you know, given its, its uh, therapeutic potency, uh, it's becoming more mainstream, in my opinion. Brian, how do you feel? Thank you. And Eve, do you want to close for us? Oh boy, don't put the weight of closing on my shoulders. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I think it's right. I think, you know, certainly at Generate, we believe that we can, we have built a platform that can not only improve certain aspects of, of, of known antibodies and proteins, but actually in silico create de novo um, uh, computer designed biotherapeutics to treat any disease, right? And that is that is the promise, right? Um, and that I think is where we have to hope that we can all go because the world that we understand today scientifically is so different. It's just a microcosm of what could the potential out there, right? And so the ability to leverage other platforms, data, machine learning, AI to understand more and explore more the parts of the, the world that we haven't gotten into to treat these intractable diseases and and overall help patients. I mean that's that's the dream, right? So certainly that's where I spend most of my time trying to trying to move us forward. Um, but I think it's a collective effort, right? It's not going to be without the traditional collaborations with large pharma companies. It's not going to be without innovative partnerships with CDMOs and manufacturing, right? So it's it's the ecosystem continuing to work together. And I think COVID has given us a great example of, of that we can do that, right? We can index on speed. We can work together differently when we have a common, you know, quote unquote enemy that is a virus. And we can really solve, uh, solve some of these big diseases for the world at large for the betterment of, of humanity. Wonderful. That that's a great closing and leading into our next panel, which is AI and machine learning at 1110. So thank you, Joe, Eve, Jim, Ryan, and Bing for your insights. We learned so much. We'll take a short break, uh, 10 minutes before the next panel at 11.10. All right, welcome back everybody. Uh, I've been so energized by the discussions that have taken place uh, in the last two panels. And I'm really excited to dive into another interesting discussion here today. Um, this one is on data mining and artificial intelligence in patient care. Uh, this is an area that is personally very near and dear to my heart is this is what I focus my own research on. Um, so I'm really thrilled to be able to introduce our panelists now. <laughs> Uh, so our first panelist is Dr. Najat Khan, who is the Chief Data Science Officer for Jensen R&D, where she leads a team of over 100 data scientists and data engineers who partner with clinicians, researchers, and external partners to drive deep impact in reimagining discovery and development of medicines um, at the, on the ND end um, at Jensen. She also co-chairs the Johnson & Johnson Data Science Council, uh, which drives the accelerated adoption of data science across J&J's sectors and global corporate functions. Our second panelist is Dr. Irene Lowe, who is the Chief Medical Officer for Data and Analytics at New York Presbyterian, and is also an Assistant Professor of Clinical Medicine at Columbia University Irving Medical Center, where she practices critical care medicine. In her role, she leads the analytics and artificial intelligence programs of the enterprise, in addition to being responsible for NYP's digital health evaluation initiatives 
and leading provider alignment for NYP's EPIC enterprise implementation. Our third panelist is Dr. Jeff Monzer, who is the Vice President of Product at Cuventus, which is focused on taking modern technologies and principles um, that have been proven in other industries, you know, using artificial intelligence, machine learning, behavioral science, and data science, and applying them to healthcare operations. In this role, he is responsible for product management, product design, and product analytics. Our fourth panelist is Dr. David Vaudry, uh, the Chief Data Informatics Officer in Geisinger. He is responsible for implementing transformational technologies and leveraging Geisinger's advanced data and informatics infrastructure to create value for patients, clinicians, researchers, and members across the 10 hospital campuses, 250 clinics, and over 500,000 member health plan. He is also an associate professor at Columbia University's Department of Biomedical Informatics and an elected fellow of the American College of Medical Informatics. And then finally, our moderator, Jeff Jonas, um, is a co-portfolio manager of the Gabelli Healthcare and Wellness Trust, as well as the Asset Fund, um, Gabelli Dividend and Income Trust and the Gabelli Global Small and Mid-Cap Value Fund. So I'm really thrilled to have all of our speakers here today. Before we kick it off, just a couple of notes. One, you can find more information about all of our panelists in the bio book. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box. And then lastly, maybe to get the um, mind focused on this particular topic, the results of our poll are in and 91% uh, of you have been frustrated on the number of times you have to put your information in a health data platform. Um, I'm astonished that there's 9% of you who have not had this frustrating experience. Um, but with that, I'm going to hand over the reins to, to Jeff and look forward to the discussion. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, since we potentially have a very broad uh, topic and theme here, I thought we could kind of frame the discussion and go around the panel and, and just highlight one or two areas that you're most excited about using data mining and artificial intelligence in your organization. And I thought we could start with Najat. Great. Hi, Jeff. Uh, hello to everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Great, great event. Um, you know, Jeff, there's, a, I would say, two, three areas overall across the you know, development life cycle where we're already applying artificial intelligence and seeing um, great progress. I would say one, as we go for more rare diseases, more um, you know, mutation or biomarker driven diseases, it becomes important to actually find those patients and find them earlier. So we have developed ECG based um, algorithms, AI based algorithms that can actually pick up um, the detection of certain rare diseases like pulmonary arterial hypertension a couple of years in advance. And that's really important because there are medicines on the market for PAH. However, patients get misdiagnosed by about four or five years. And why use ECG? You know, it's a, it's a workflow, it's a, it's a procedure that's already done. So you're not adding something new to the system or not creating disparity with new wearables sometimes, which can be challenging for more diverse patients to access. But then, and it's also one of the procedure that gets done early on in the patient's journey. So right now we're validating those algorithms and then also looking at how do we get approval to eventually be able to deploy them in partnership. And this is where collaboration becomes really important, both with uh, medical institutions, uh, regulators and so forth. I'll maybe share another example, which is completely another side of the spectrum, which is how do we actually run trials more efficiently and effectively with the right amount of diversity? We built um, for our COVID-19 vaccine program, this was one of the big questions, right? Because um, COVID uh, vaccine or any vaccine trial is event-driven. Um, so the more events you can get because you're in areas of high incidence of that disease, the more effective the trial is because you have more rich data, but it's also more efficient to run it faster. So we partnered with MIT to build a machine learning AI model that not only looked at predicting what the infections could be, but added covariates such as um, social compliance, being able to predict that county by county, not you know, at, a, at a global aggregated level. And then also racial disparity and where can we find more diversity? It was a large model, 
and we did a lot of back testing. And this is something I want to emphasize in AI. It's so important. The first readout you get is not perfect, and you have to validate these things well. But you know, the, the proof is in the pudding. So 90% um, of the predictions that we had were dead on. And we ended up saving, or we ended up shaving, I should say, about six weeks of the development timeline. Every day counts in a pandemic. And this mm -hmm. was a global model. So this is why we went to Brazil, we went to South Africa, we went to Argentina, the US, et cetera, because we followed the data. It wasn't, we didn't follow our preference of where we have gone before. And we also had one of the most diverse trials um, because of the fact that if you start with data and try to over-index and go in places where there is more diversity, couple that with good operational excellence, you can actually get that. And now we're scaling this type of approach using AI machine learning across our pipeline. That's great. Irene, could you chime in? So Jeff, I know this is kind of what your company Cuventus was founded on. Do you want to give a couple of points that are most interesting and, and relevant to your organization? Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, so uh, we're a healthcare technology company and we specialize in improving healthcare operations uh, using AI and automation and machine learning. Um, and that's a little bit of a different lens. I think there's so many exciting and valuable use cases on the purely clinical side, and we've already talked through a few of those. Um, but there are a number of opportunities uh, supporting operational activities that uh, caregivers have to do in the course of the delivery of care. So if you think of a spectrum of activities in a healthcare system where you can apply AI, uh, you've got the back office on one end, you can apply it in billing and revenue cycle, and you've got the front office on the other, which is where clinical care is being delivered to patients. And you know, AI can be used to read x-rays and that, and that kind of thing. There's a lot of research in that area. Uh, we like to sit in the middle of that spectrum, which is all the operations that directly support the del delivery of care that typically require a caregiver in the loop. So these are kind of hybrid automation type workflows. Um, and those are things like uh, managing patient length of stay through effective discharge planning. Uh, you know, when should the patient leave the hospital? When will they, uh, where will they need to go after they leave? Um, what are the logistical and operational barriers that might come up that prevent them from being able to go home or go to post-acute care on time? And those are also problems like how do you improve OR utilization through surgery scheduling? How do we maximize access for patients and surgeons to, um, to get into the operating rooms so that we can get the full value from those resources? Um, and there are a number of other use cases like that in both acute and ambulatory care. Um, and so that, you know, the reason that we focus on that is that our thesis is that we believe that one of the primary constraints preventing our healthcare system in the U.S. from achieving its potential is the operations that go around the delivery of care. We already have world-class caregivers, world-class medicines, therapies, equipment, um, but we don't yet have consistent world-class operations to support that delivery of care. Um, and so that's where we get really excited about all of these optimization opportunities applying these types of uh, AI and machine learning techniques. Okay, and then David, you bring an interesting perspective being both an insurer and a provider. So what's your take here? Well, thank you, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be with everyone this morning. Uh, really an honor to be part of the panel. And as you said, Geisinger is both a payer as well as a provider. And so we may look at this uh, perhaps a little bit more broadly than, than some other, um, you know, uh, organizations working in this space. Uh, we think of Geisinger as something of a leader in, in the concept of value-based care. So if you think of value defined as quality divided by cost, you know, we're, we're trying to favorably impact that equation. And fundamentally, I think Geisinger's vision is to make better health easy for the people that we serve, our patients, our members. And when I look at, you know, at the spectrum of artificial intelligence in healthcare, um, this goes back decades, but I, I would posit that there has been an awful lot of hype, especially in recent years, and maybe not a lot uh, to show for it. Um, now, my colleagues on the panel may or may not agree with that statement, but I think we've seen a lot of investment and, and fairly little return on that investment. Maybe, you know, uh, we're still waiting, maybe it will come, at, uh, you know, but I, I think for me, and our approach at Geisinger is to be a little bit more pragmatic, perhaps, than, than we have been in the past. And really ask, you know, where can these technologies benefit uh, our patients and our members and our providers? And um, if you allow me to really simplify it, you know, for us, it's around population health management and getting the right service to the right person at the right time. 
So, uh, and, and candidly, the artificial intelligence, the machine learning, the data science behind that is, is the easy part. You know, the translation is the difficulty. The, uh, the application, if you will, is really where the, uh, the rubber hits the road. And that's, that's something that's challenging. The AI can give us a prioritized list of whom to reach out to first, but it, in, by and large, hasn't been successful in accomplishing the type of outreach that's needed. A lot of that is still relying on human um, intervention and, and can't be fully automated. Well, one of the areas I've been really interested in has been you know, wearables like watches and Fitbits, and also connected devices like wireless glucose meters, scales, blood pressure cuffs. And there's been some interesting business models around it too, from Omada Health or Lubongo. So I'm just wondering, uh, this is kind of a jump ball, how you're using devices and wearables in your practice. Maybe, maybe, maybe just to build on something that David mentioned, which I completely I agree with parts of it, which is, um, there is a lot of hype in the space, and I'll use the example of wearables as, an, as, as one, but it's about how you apply it. You have to figure out the problem first and not start with the technology itself. And I think that happens a ton because a cool algorithm gets published, everyone tries to race there. But you know, for me, what becomes really important at Janssen and J&J is we have a whole portfolio and pipeline of medicines and every single program has a different need, right? So let's talk about wearables. Like in immunology and neuroscience, one of the big challenges is we're not able to stratify our patients well. The endpoints we use for some of these clinical trials are just subjective and noisy, right? Some of them are just like written down by somebody. I mean, it's, it's so much variability, subjectivity. So they're using wearables and devices, but not too many, because it's not practical to say in the real world, someone's gonna have like five different things measuring you know, different components. But it becomes really important to say, okay, what am I trying to measure? And do those phase, as I call, non-interventional phase zero studies to actually validate that whatever it's picking up against the current gold standard, even if that's not perfect. And many people jump the gun and don't do that and say, hey, here's a cool app that you can use, like a probabilistic reward task for you know, depression, but it's not been validated. And then to David's point, you don't get the uptake, you don't get the traction. And then we move on to another app. Right, so that's how we're doing it very differently, I would say at, at Janssen in the last year, where you have to know your pipeline and your business inside out. You need to know your stakeholders, patients, providers, regulators, and then say, what are those specific questions you wanna answer? So for wearables, I will say there's a lot of promise, but Jeff, for, for me, I'm taking a test and learn approach. You know, nocturnal scratch is something that's really important in some immunoderm diseases that we have. Um, so what we're doing is doing decentralized trials where you can actually measure, well, you can actually take scans of the image uh, of your skin. You can also do passive monitoring to understand how much our patient's moving at during their sleep. But I'll tell you, we're not totally there yet. We need to first validate it before we actually use it as a secondary or someday primary endpoint in a trial Right now it's, now, it's exploratory. So I think less is more and to do it well will actually move this um, space forward. I'll, I'll just throw out another interesting perspective as we're talking about wearables. I agree with Dr. Khan's uh, comments and obviously you're thinking about wearables, I believe from the perspective of a, a medical device, which is a valid and an important perspective. And patient uh, too, right? And patients too. A lot of the design sometimes the patient sure. Sure, but yes. M meaning, um, you're talking about it as a, as a as a medical application, something that's perhaps FDA, you know, uh, uh, reviewed. You're doing clinical trials, etc. You know, we've also got this wide world of of consumer devices. You know, so you see Google and and Apple and and uh, Amazon now in this space, and you know that that's a you know. The line may blur uh, at some point, and and there's a, a really interesting question about who pays for these things, um, who reviews the data that they generate. Is it a is it my primary care doctor's responsibility to, you know, to look at my you know uh, measurements for my smartwatch, et cetera? I don't I don't think the you know the those questions have been settled yet, but they're fascinating questions to be sure. Yeah, it seems like there needs to be a, a central monitoring station or, or some way to, you know, again, mine through the reams and reams of data that this is producing and, again, identify either the patients that are at risk or diagnose them or that, that seems to be what I've heard from, from this question. 
uh, I guess, you know, one of the other things that we touched on earlier is disparities in health and whether that's based on gender or sex or race or even geographies around the world. So I guess I'm wondering how your organizations are using technology to kind of address that. I don't want to be the first person to jump in, but I'm happy <laughs> to. Um, okay. Uh, so, you know, I think that's a really, really important point. I, and I just want to preface that by saying the number of times I've sat in conferences where people have said only 4% of the, you know, eligible trials, uh, patients get uh, enrolled in a trial. And I think there's two, three ways of going about it. Number one, in many cases, we are in diseases that disproportionately affect uh, those with, you know, minorities and, 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 and others, right? Racial diversity. First of all, it's important that even when you're doing the research, forget about clinical trials, right? Figuring out what's the biomarker, what are the subpopulation, that we actually have data we start with that's representative. And that's actually difficult to get because we don't in the US have a beautiful longitudinal, I'm thinking like Norway or Sweden, cradle to grave, like longitudinal multimodal uh, data set for patients. And I think that's something we need to push for. It's a little bit aspirational. So what do you do in the meantime? I think I'll give you a couple of examples. Number one, you know, as we are creating some of these digital endpoints or even these decentralized trials, we actually are looking at images of patients with a spectrum, right, of, of, of diversity so that we can ensure that our algorithms that are being developed actually pick up and don't just work for some a subset of population that, you know, uh, we have more images for. Super, super important to do that, that your data set and your algorithms are generalizable, right, um, in, in that space, because then you develop appropriate endpoints that are not biased against um, certain populations. The other thing I also mentioned um, in terms of our clinical trials and when we're running them and then eventually having access for patients, we're using a lot of real world data. And just so Jeff, I'm expanding a little bit from AI to also talk about real world data, if that's okay, to ensure that we are not just going to, and David Geisinger is great, but we're not just going to like the large academic medical centers to find patients for our trials and then access, but we're actually looking at it just where are the patients that are eligible for this therapy? And you know what we found? In a lot of diseases, we found like 80% of the patients are not in these large academic medical centers, although that was our initial hypothesis, right? And then what we found is further is in that 60 to 80%, they are much more over-indexed in terms of being diverse because they're going to community clinics, right? These different areas that we don't have great footprint. So it requires investment from our side to actually ensure we have trial sites and then commercially also access to these diverse patients and put the right investment behind it. But I just wanna say that, you know, sometimes people ask me data science can do things faster. I say yes, but the value generation is where it actually makes a huge difference. It's not by accident that our vaccine trial has so much diversity, right? Higher than census numbers. It's not by accident. You can use AI, RWE for good and actually ensure that the intent is where it starts. That's what I mean by the question, to have more diverse patients and population actually happens. And the last thing I'll say, take decentralized trial, right? Why do you think a lot of diverse patients don't end up in trials? Because of the burden of taking a whole day off to go to a center and to do these procedures. I mean, so let's use AI for good, right? If we can actually create better endpoints so they don't have to come in, or like David was saying, sometimes it's just the operational round game, right? Why don't we get nurses to go to them versus them having to come in? or offer like, you know, transportation support. So it goes beyond even just AI, but these are the kinds of like aspects we can use to actually in like what I say, level the playing field in terms of who can enroll in trial and who can get access to medicines. Yeah, I love your term ground game. So I'm wondering how our two providers are uh, executing on that. I, 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 can, I can start on that. Uh, it's a very interesting question about how artificial intelligence can um, hopefully mitigate, um, help reduce health disparities. Um, you know, one of the, the great examples of doing the opposite, unfortunately, you know, was published a couple of years ago, I'm sure is well familiar to many in the audience where um, an algorithm used by a large payer was preferentially um, allocating care to a white population as compared to a, a black or brown population that um, 
you know, seems unconscionable, like reprehensible. Like how could your algorithm be, you know, blatantly racist? And as you unpack the details behind that, well, the algorithm, you know, did what the algorithm does. It's sort of blind. Um, uh, race, in fact, wasn't even included as, a, as an input into the algorithm. But what was, was the historical cost of care. And if you're sort of inferring that the historical cost of someone's care predicts their future need, and then you understand that the cost of care for black or brown communities was lower historically than a white population. And now your algorithm is suggesting that white people need a greater degree of care than, uh, than your minority black or brown communities. Like that's how those sorts of things happen. So the first thing we have to do is make sure we're measuring and mitigating bias in our own algorithms. But another angle of this that I'd love to, to, to speak about for a moment or two, because I know it's a pervasive problem everywhere, um, is the challenge of even measuring accurately the different characteristics that we know are important to, uh, to understand disparities in the first place. You know, when you look at large data sets around the country, you know, race and ethnicity is not collected accurately, maybe only 60% of the time. Um, and even less things like preferred language or veteran status or sexual gender minority uh, status. Um, we don't often look at, at urban, rural uh, types of uh, disparities as well. So measuring these types of things uh, is really critical and, and something we still have a lot of work to do before we can get to the point where we uh, you know, can really measure true disparities. We've got to measure the characteristics that, uh, that you know, are associated with those disparities. And I just think Irene's point is such an important one because you know sometimes people will say, What's the big thing that AI can change? But I think all the examples that we're talking about is super important practical problems you can solve. You don't have to wait for the perfect data to be created, but you gotta be cognizant of the limitations and therefore how you can apply it. But I think I just wanted to call that out because it's not gonna be this like big headline. We need to move away from that and actually solve problems that really exist. Yeah, no, well, I we touched on oh. I was Go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo uh, each of Najat, David, and Irene. Uh, I, I think each of those are critically important points. The foundation has to be there um, uh, from a data perspective to be able to do post-processing of that data in a thoughtful way that doesn't perpetuate disparities. But at the same time, there are things that we can be doing right out the gate um, that are helping to address those. And I think each of, each of us have highlighted some of those. Um, I'll just speak really quickly on the machine learning side specifically. Um, it is a place where you have to be quite careful. You know, um, David brought up a great example. These models require data to train on, and if there are disparities in the underlying data and the way that different patient populations have been treated in the past, then any machine learning algorithm has the risk of perpetuating that kind of disparity in the types of recommendations that it makes. So both from a data collection, uh, training, feature engineering, um, and model governance perspective, I think to be responsible in the way that you're delivering that, you need to be thinking about each of the steps of model delivery um, and making sure that you're measuring each of the possible areas uh, that bias could have been introduced. And then proactively, both in terms of the technology, but also in the way that that gets manifested to end users, uh, making sure that you have the controls in place to ensure that you're not propagating or, or exacerbating that kind of problem. So a lot of the data gets entered into an electronic health record or, or electronic medical record. I know they've been controversial. I know a lot of people haven't really loved them, but they're kind of a fact of life at this point. So I'm just wondering, maybe we can start with you, Jeff. What are one or two ways that we could really improve them significantly and, and make them a lot more user friendly? Yeah, it's a very interesting uh, question. And I'll bring the lens of um, uh, uh, you know technology uh, healthcare technology company that sits in the ecosystem that is both dependent on um, and in some cases limited by uh, the capabilities of electronic medical records. I think there are two keys ultimately. Uh, one is data interoperability, um, being able to get data out of EHRs and just as importantly, being able to put data back into them. They form the system of record. Um, they have an entrenched position in uh, our healthcare landscape. Um, and as a result, uh, there's a lot of control that they can exert over the ability to add uh, new innovation uh, into the ecosystem. And that, in order to do that well, you need to be able to get data out, put data back in with minimal friction. 
The other piece that I think um, sometimes gets a little bit overlooked uh, is application interoperability as well. Um, the reality is that most clinicians are in the electronic medical record system uh, for the majority of their day, uh, and there still isn't sufficient flexibility uh, provided by EMRs to give health systems the ability to let third parties meet those clinicians seamlessly in the context of those workflows. Um, I will say there have been some strides recently toward both of these, but, but there is a lot of work still to do. You know, it's, it's that dichotomy of EHRs have unlocked a, a wave of new innovation by creating that digital data substrate on which others can build. But on the other hand, they've dampened innovation as well via the amount of control that they exert over the market and the friction in those two domains of interoperability that have been created. So ultimately, I think it's really important for the innovation landscape around healthcare IT that consumer and regulatory and health system pressure on EHRs to be interoperability minded continues. Um, because I think that potential, um, uh, it unlocks a lot of additional value creation in the US health system um, if we are able to uh, create an environment where those types of interoperability are, are a lot more frictionless. And do our providers have any feedback on the EMRs? I always say, Jeff, that, you know, complaining about the EHR is a shooting fish in the barrel sort of activity. Like it's a, it's, there's plenty to complain about. Um, for me, there are two big things that electronic health records have, and they're obvious things, um, but maybe worth stating that electronic health records have improved. The first is legibility of the medical record. And the second is access to that record. You know, the years past, people spent untold hours searching for charts and when they found them deciphering you know what was going on in the chart because it was all handwritten and and sparse and scattered now so those are two obvious things that uh, we sometimes you know forget you know about the the good old days weren't maybe all that good and then the other thing i, I think that you know we kind of get a little bit wrong as an industry and i'm not here to defend i think there are plenty of problems with the hrs uh to be sure i spent a lot of my career trying to make them better and easier to use and and, and more effective but the other thing is that this is not you know our, our vendors that are imposing all these requirements the documentation burden that now exists the you know everybody wants a piece of the action um whether you're focused on reimbursement or whether you're focused on quality or you're focused on various things from a regulatory point of view research, you know, everybody wants one more click, if you will, to be added to the electronic health record. And those clicks, you know, just add up to this you know, state that we're in where it's just very overwhelming and, and we're finding that, that providers spend more of their time, much more of their time in documentation related tasks, spending much more of their time with their head in a, in a, in a keyboard and a screen than they are interacting with their patients. And I don't think anybody went to medical school or nursing school you know, to turn into a data entry clerk. And so I think that's one of the big challenges, but I don't know that it's the, the, the vendors of the electronic health records that are entirely to blame for that. We talk a lot about next generation technologies, voice being probably the most um, alluring at the moment where, you know, maybe it can just with AI magically translate my office visit, my interaction with my primary care doctor into a note, you know, that has structured data elements and everything just sort of gets recorded, sort of a virtual uh, scribe and transcriptionist, if you will. And so that technology is nascent, but seems to be coming along. Uh, some are calling it ambient voice. So there's a lot of potential there, but I don't think it's quite prime time yet. But uh, that might be one thing to keep uh, our eye on in the future. Okay, great. Well, we've gotten a number of questions from the audience, both uh, submitted in advance and during this session. Uh, I guess one of them is really about using technology and artificial intelligence to improve the discharge and to even predict or prevent rehospitalization or even death. Um, uh, David, do you want to maybe start off with that? Sure. So. I think I would uh, slightly refine um, uh, the, the way you asked the question, Jeff, if I may. Uh, and, and again, I'm a bit of a, a, a skeptic. <laughs> so I think everybody has to recognize that about me. I don't think that an algorithm is going to prevent somebody from being readmitted or um, 
prevent somebody from having an adverse uh, event. I think a human being more likely than not is gonna be the one that does that informed by the output of an algorithm. And that may sound like a silly distinction, um, but I, I think the goal of the, of the artificial intelligence for me is, you know, or the, the data science, whatever you wanna call this, is to generate a risk score, generate a prediction that someone can use to change their behavior in a way that favorably impacts the, you know, the type of uh, outcomes that you're describing. If, uh, and I think that's sort of the state of the art today. I don't think this is going to be a closed loop system anytime soon, um, but it can, it can help facilitate getting the right information to the right person at the right time. Um, but those are, that's challenging. Like that's a lot of rights, if you will, uh, the right information, the right person, the right time, the right context, so that they can make a different decision. If I had a risk score that says, you know, David's about to be discharged from a hospital, and he has an 80% chance of being readmitted within 30 days, you know, let's say that's a 100% accurate prediction, but whom are you going to tell? What do you expect them to do differently than they're doing today? And how do you give them the resources to, you know, to implement that intervention? Those are the really, really challenging parts. So these, these readmission risk productions are sort of a dime a dozen, but the operationalization is, I think, where we fall down. I just want to echo, I mean, David, you said the most important word in my mind is operationalization. Um, and we, I know we talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, when it comes to things like discharge planning, readmission, um, uh, speaking as a uh, you know, company that develops those types of algorithms, the algorithm development is not the hardest part. Um, it is the way that it gets integrated into workflow and really making decisions easier. And I think Look, it's getting way more important to be able to do that. Our staff are completely overloaded. Um, we, we're going to be facing more and more staffing shortages as we look forward. We have to be able to help reprioritize, help inform the action, do hybrid automation. David, you said, I think something else really important. These systems generally for this type of problem are not going to be closed loop anytime soon. They probably shouldn't be. Um, there is a human element to each of these uh, types of decisions. How do you intervene to help prevent or readmission, or how do you make sure that the discharge plan is right? So thinking carefully about the behavioral science aspects of it, and how do you <clears throat> integrate the human into the loop of that automation or that multi-step workflow is by far the most impor important part. Um, the algorithm forms a small component of it, but it really is about understanding the workflow, the problem you're trying to solve, and then integrating into the workflow in a very thoughtful way. I think Najah was making that point earlier as well. Um, so just wanted to echo that. I think it's such an important point. And I think that's why, you know, I mean, I think one aspect is a lot of these are gonna be tuned so that they can actually enable better decision-making. I completely agree. But the more we can actually do these prospective validations, even in a smaller setting, I know, you know, it doesn't happen consistently, just to see what's the clinical utility of something like this, right? And and, you know, we've done that, like the one I was mentioning by the pH one, and a lot of people ask me, you have this algorithm, just go deploy it. I said, yeah, yeah, but you gotta, it's like any product, right? You gotta make sure that the users actually find it useful. It's like basic, I'm saying the basic principles. It's not even about AI machine learning. You have to make sure that there's clinical utility. And the other piece that it helps you do with some of these prospective validations is, also just the validation of the algorithm itself. How does it work in the wild, right? How does it work when you're actually doing it on an everyday in and out setting? I, one thing that I found important to do that well is to actually partner with those that have two components, relatively mature infrastructure so you can actually integrate into something or else it's like, you know, you can't even get it off the ground. But then the other is actually having physicians or clinicians, et cetera, that are bilingual. They understand, they're, of course, clinicians first. But they understand enough about AI, machine learning, some of the conversations that we're just having. Because if not, then it can go one or the other way, right? Like it can be, yes, it's going to solve everything and it's imagined, which is not. And also, or it's going to be like, you know, we shouldn't use it at all. And the last one I want to make is the interpretability of the algorithm is actually really important. This is what we found, right? Nurses and physicians are much more likely to use it if they understand what is it actually picking up. Like for the algorithm we had developed, you can see what are those features that hard to see with, you know, naturalized, what is it picking up in that ECG that makes it so highly predictive of the certain disease? The minute you get a physician or clinician to understand that, you see a complete difference in their engagement model. And this is, I think, Jeff, what you were saying, some of the behavioral science, 
but like you have to do the pull through, right? You have to do the pull through and make it interpretable. So just a few things in terms of what we have learned as we've tried to, you know, validate and, and do more than some others said that we should be doing, but I think it's the right approach to make for a more sustainable, sustained use of something um, AI and machine learning based. Okay, I did have two more questions about specifically clinical trials. And between technology and COVID, are clinical trials just permanently going to be faster? And then the second part of this question is, do decentralized trials hurt the centralized sites, and are they going to get squeezed out over time? I'm happy to take it. But David, if you want to start first, and then I'll build on. Uh, I was just going to say, Najat, I'd love to hear your answer to this question. But uh, briefly, for me, I, I hope so. I hope things will continue to operate um, on an accelerated pace without, you know, uh, introducing risks of, you know, that are associated with moving too, too quickly. Um, Najat, I think, said something really interesting earlier that most clinical trials have historically been conducted in uh, you know more central academic medical center environments, AMCs are about five percent of hospitals in the country. Uh, they pro provide a disproportionate uh, amount of care because they tend to be large and and uh, serve a, a large number of people. But that's five percent of the hospitals. That leaves ninety five percent in in other parts of the country, in rural settings, uh, and, and other places um, where. There are people that can and should be participating in clinical research that want to be participating in clinical research, providers that want to be conducting clinical research, but their day job is, you know, as uh, as Jeff I think pointed out, uh, more than a, a than they can handle at the moment. How do we make it easy to conduct um, biomedical research on a large scale? I, I think is a really important sort of transformational question for us to tackle. Yeah, I mean, David, great points. Just to build on that, look, I think COVID has accelerated it. You know how it's not the data or the models. We kind of had some of that, but it's having that belief system to do something differently. It actually takes a lot of guts to say, you know what, I'm not going to go with what I've already always done, but I'm going to add this machine learning model, this new thing. And that was our biggest, you know, um, I think hurdle, I would say, when we actually develop that algorithm, it's not just developing and validating it, it's actually getting the pull through into operations to actually get it to be used. I think going forward, this shows, you know, it's nothing like a good example or a win to actually get people to think differently. And when you do it for one of the biggest programs that everybody's watching and you don't wanna get it wrong, um, you know, that, that helps with that change, changing people's minds. So specifically, I think number one, you know, what I mentioned before, which is around, you know, using data to be very unbiased with algorithms, you know, what's the eligible patient, what's that inclusion exclusion, and this is what ends up happening. You have trial sites that we've never been to before that are set up to do research, so we can do that here and now, but then there's a lot of sites that come up that are not set up, and there you have to make a decision, right? Like, how do you, and David was mentioning some of the community clinics, and Jeff mentioned how busy they are, you have to make sure you actually put in, this is what I meant, the resources, the infrastructure needed to actually create them to be clinical sites. And we can do that because in many areas like IBD, multiple myeloma, we're in it for the long haul. This is not a clinical trial we're doing one day and then we stop. We're in it for the long haul with a pipeline of medicines coming through different regimens. So that's where we're taking a two-pronged approach to actually invest more midterm and then the sites that are ready today to actually do that um, here and now. The other thing I'll mention around diversity and inclusion, the type of modeling we used to go, again, go with data first. Where are some of these underserved you know, communities? Where should we be doing these sites? How do we have the right referral systems? We are not doing that across the board for our different groups. You know, and I'll be honest, it, it doesn't it doesn't all get fixed in a day, but actually having that approach in our ways of working and thinking completely shifts what we're doing. So I'd say those are the ways I think COVID-19 is a catalyst, but I wouldn't say it's the single event that's made it happen, but it's definitely accelerated it. Okay, great. Well, I think we're just out of, about out of time. So I'd really like to thank all four of you for participating in this. And I think I'd like to turn it over to Carrie for some closing remarks. Yeah, um, okay, I'll, I'll take care of that. Thank you very much for attending our symposium today, everyone. We greatly appreciate your interest in the healthcare industry, in Gobelli Funds, and Columbia Business School. 
Thank you, Carrie, for your partnership and uh, the speakers for your time and insight. Special thanks to Mary Gabelli and his support in me, Carrie, at the symposium. Please contact us if you have any questions. We will follow up with a short survey for your feedback. We look forward to connecting in the future. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for being here.